Welcome to the Rider Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. Hola. And Larry Korea. Aloha. Today's episode, Dave Butler Expose. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Rider Dojo. Glad to have you back with us. And today, Larry, today's a special day because today not only do you have our two beautiful faces that no one can see, probably for the best, we also have a much more sexy version of a person with us in the audience, in the studio audience with us today. Yeah, one of the few writers that really could have his own OnlyFans and actually make money off it. Yeah, does have. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> We'll put the link in the comments. Um, no, so we have been joined today. This is the first time we've had a guest star and a good friend of ours. We'd like to welcome out Dave Butler, who uh, you could buy his books as DJ Butler. Hey, Sorry. thanks, guys. Yeah, glad to have you with us. We're uh, we're pretty excited. Um, Dave has Dave's one of those guys that we, like Larry and I have known him for geez for freaking ever. Um, I don't, I don't know if Dave's heard this, but we have actually talked about you on this show. Oh, yeah. We've talked about you quite a bit. Actually, people tell me when that happens. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you know it's good, right? I, yes. No, no. They, they, they all, that's the second thing they say. Don't worry. It was it was okay. It was good. That's because they haven't heard the outtakes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we, uh, we actually edit out all the horrible things we say about other writers. Yeah. Yes. That's just for the Patreon subscribers. Uh, yeah. We should do that. I know, right? <laughs> so... Uh, so we've known Dave for quite a long time. And the cool thing about Dave is that he, you've done a bajillion different things in terms of, um, you know, your, your own professional career outside of writing. And then obviously you've been, you've basically had your fingers everywhere within the writing world process. So rather than me and Larry pretend like we know everything about your life, because I mean, that would sound awfully stalkerish of us. <laughs> I mean, so how about you kind of give our, our audience kind of the, the, the Dave Butler expose, the Dave Butler, uh, you know, cliff notes version. Well, I met Larry by stalking him. So it would only be turnabout as fair play. Um, so the cliff note versions of me as a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was uh, seven years old, eight years old, somewhere in there. My dad uh, was an economics professor. He went to a conference and he brought home a gift for everybody because he'd been gone for four days or something. And my gift was the 25th anniversary Silver Jubilee edition of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit uh, with the Daryl K. Sweet covers in a kind of fake gold leaf uh, box. Nice. And, yeah, it was very good. And and um, I basically put myself into bed and didn't get out for a week uh, until I'd read them. I almost burned down. Um, well, I almost lit the bed on fire. I fell asleep. I had a little... Uh, uh, a lamp, incandescent bulb on kind of a nodding hinge on the headboard, and I fell asleep holding the book, reading it, uh, and the lamp nodded down and came to rest on the pillow, and when I woke up, it had burned all the way through the pillowcase, a perfect disc, uh, down to the pillow, which happily was some, you know, rough corduroy fabric or whatever. It was, you know... Poor person pillow, right? Uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, therefore, I did not immolate uh, in my bed. J.R. Tolkien almost killed you. J.R. Tolkien personally assaulted me. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I would have attacked him, but he died just shortly before I was born. Uh, so my counterattack was, was foiled ab initio. Uh, yeah, so I decided I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I did all the things that I think probably everybody who's listening to this is who is who is a writer uh, did, right? I mean, I, I kept trying, as a reader, I kept trying to recapture the Tolkien experience. And so I read the stuff everybody at that time was reading, trying to find Tolkien again. And so I read, you know, Terry Brooks, and I read Stephen Donaldson, and I read all this stuff, right, that was out there. Um, and uh, the... I, I I didn't really know how to write a book. I remember when I was that age, I've got a journal, and um, I wrote the back cover copy for a book that didn't exist, and I wrote, like, the inside front page excerpt from a book that did not exist, <laughs> which all I can remember of both of those is that the inside, you know, front page extract 
ended with the entered with uh, somebody I don't remember who saying Arun and the old door opened and that's that's my <laughs> my earliest surviving creative writing is 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 that line right there um, so uh, you know when I was I was eight or something um, so I did uh, I did creative writing classes when I could uh, junior high and high school um, and um, and uh, went to college thinking I was going to become a writer, and uh, and and then I chickened out. And I chickened out because I wanted to get married, and uh, the girl I wanted to marry didn't want to be poor, and that seemed fair. So, <laughs> so I went to law school instead, um, and and punted on the whole novelist for thing for a lot of years. I, I still wrote. I, I got screenwriting software. I had this fantasy that I would write a screenplay, mail it to Hollywood Studio. Someone would, of course, buy it. My uh, drudge occupation as a, uh, a law firm associate would come to an end. But it turns out when you mail in scripts to Hollywood, California from London or from Connecticut, they don't read them. You know, they don't care. So uh, nothing came of that. Uh, Which is actually funny because this is going to come full circle, as you guys will see in this, because later on in Dave's career, he wound up, and we're going to have him do an episode on this for us, as an editor, an acquisitions editor, and reading submissions from people for a publishing yeah. house. Yeah. Yeah. Would you have rejected you? Um, you know, I probably would have rejected me. They were, <laughs> they were, I, I do regret I should say I wrote a novel as, as a senior in high school, and I am pretty confident I have successfully destroyed all copies of that. We'll see. Uh, Someone out there has it. Yeah, I, that, that that I would not. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything in it that's like, I mean, just bad. That's the only issue, right? It's not like someone would read and go, this guy is a pervert or whatever. No, I just, it's just bad. I was 17. But well, we uh, also know being a pervert doesn't hold you back in this business. Either. It would have, it would have sold if I was enough, if I was a little more of a pervert, probably. So, um, so, but I do kind of regret that I don't have the screenplays actually. Cause I think, I think, I think it would be, uh, in fact, I may have them on a, I got some two and a half inch floppies somewhere. It's possible. Oh, that's Ooh. cool. Yeah. It's possible. I've got, uh, I've got those. Uh, I had a, I had a, uh, one script was about an Elvis impersonator mm -hmm. who in fact was Elvis. Elvis had, uh, was in hiding, living as an Elvis impersonator and, and an evil motorcycle gang discovered him and, and tried to kill him. Uh, <laughs> I, uh. I, I wrote with, I think, three or four or whatever. Um, and I wrote a lot of songs. I wrote a lot of songs. I got into songwriting, recording. Um, and that, by the way, was great discipline. Like in the same way that in theory, Twitter can be great discipline. Like in theory, if you can, if you can uh, school yourself to make a really good accurate, concise point coming to a punchline with an important last word in 280 characters, that's useful rhetorical training. In practice, that's not what happens. But like in theory, right, that could be a, a good writing school. Yeah, in practice, it's more like, Ree! Yeah, in practice, it's <laughs> totally, totally different. <laughs> you disagree with me. It's like, you're bad. It's I, mostly... I'm just an alpha predator that roams the wilds of Twitter, picking off the sick and the weak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the, yes. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, that was kind of what I did, you know, uh, until 2010, uh, 2010, I got a bit of luck. I think that, um, I think there's two kinds of fools. There's people who get lucky and will deny that they were lucky and people who uh, who don't succeed and, and they attribute their lack of success also to luck. Luck is important. Luck is not everything. Um, but, uh, I, I got lucky in my legal career. I, I, I had some things happen, which meant that I could basically not work for a couple of years, which was fabulous. And I actually thought briefly I would become a punk, uh, music producer. I thought, I, I thought, you know, I've been in a lot of music. I thought this would be this would be fun. And then a friend of mine reminded me that no, you always want to be a writer. What about that? Thank goodness for that person. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I'd be up in Boise, you know, uh, going go to cowpunk shindigs and looking for 
you know, uh, the next Blink-182 or whatever. So... Um, I don't think anyone's accused them of being punk lately. <laughs> well, so, um, yeah, so I started, I started, uh, full, full time. Um, I could do it full time out of the gate. And so this was great. I had a writing gig, uh, a writing, sorry, a writing, uh, group, which was really, um, very, very valuable. Uh, and, um, they were, we're all kind of within spitting distance, distance of each other in terms of career. One guy had a two book Simon and Schuster deal. Uh, another guy picked up his deal before I did mine. So we, we were all kind of about the same on the cusp. Um, so, uh, this is when I met, uh, actually I think both you guys, I, I, I met Larry. I came to Life, the Universe, and Everything in 2012, mm -hmm. February 2012. I think we all met around the same and, time. And uh, I don't remember. I think I probably met you there, but I remember you from Worldcon later that year. Oh, oh wait, it's 20, hold on. No, no. I was. It was 2011, February 2011. I remember you oh, from uh, been World Con, Reno. Reno. Yeah, that would have been. That'd have been I the know one that for we went sure to. I met you at Reno. We yeah. played the Conquest of Narath in somebody's hotel room. We did, at, at, right? I think yeah. it was the three of us, maybe Nick, uh, yeah. as the fourth. I, uh, I. So the first time I remember I met you was LTWE, and I remember I, I've actually told this story on this show about uh, how to like network at conventions yeah. because if you guys remember on this oh, yeah. prior episode, Dave Butler is the guy that invaded the green room with sandwiches. Yeah, that's right. It turns out they won't throw you out if you bring food. Uh, yeah, we just assumed he was supposed to be there because he just brought us yeah. this giant thing Worst, of Subway sandwiches. Words to live by right there. Yeah. But not Subway. They were actually uh, from uh, that Provo place. So well, not not Subway the chain, but Sub Sandwiches. Oh, is it the place right behind it? Yeah, Sensuous Sandwich. That's a great sandwich, Sensuous that Sandwich. That's awesome. There. Yeah. Brought to you by Sensuous Sandwich. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there was the, 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 the sort of five headline guests, and I didn't actually get to meet everybody on that. Um, or, or I, I said a few, at least a few words, but fast forward kind of two or three years and, and everybody who was on that list, including Dave Farland, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Modisett, others had all become, um, at least, you know, on, on a first name basis, professional, you know, uh, not necessarily go to the same barbecues, but, but, uh, friendly. Uh, so yeah, so I did stalk you and I, I might've met you there too, Steve. I remember you from later that year at Reno. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, now that you bring it up, I do remember the game at Reno. Yeah. Um, and I, that was, that was one of two cons that Larry and I went to together that year. We went to that one and then we crashed, um, San Diego, crash San Diego. All right. Uh, World Fantasy, that's what it's called. Yeah. We crashed that later the year. Well, and I believe that was the same year you would have met Tony Weisskopf. Oh, I yeah, met you would have met her at Reno. You would have met her at Reno. Yeah. Yep. That's that when I first correct. met her. Which as is, well. as, as, as this story goes on, you will understand why that's, that's important. That's important. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's important. Um, it ended up being important for me too, oddly enough. Yeah, that's you right. Uh, so, okay. So, um, uh, so uh, what happened in the two years? At the end of the two years, I, I uh, had to work for a living again. I went back and started doing sort of the corporate training and some of the other things that I do now. I do, Steve was alluding to this, a mix of things. I still do some legal work. But in the meantime, you know, for two, in two years, I managed to get my first agent, uh, get dumped by my first agent, uh, start self-publishing, um, and, uh, and build up, uh, a, a, a backlog, I guess you would say, or a, an inventory of unpublished novels that that have all no, that's not even true not all of them have most of them have since come out either i published them or they came out with uh kevin anderson's word fire press mm -hmm. uh one of those was witchy eye i wrote witchy eye um which is an epic fantasy novel set in an early 19th century fantasy america um i had that uh, at i was at reno Talking about it, I uh, I I stalked Tony Weisskopf at Reno, uh, and other other editors. I went, which to is the... actually funny because I try. Remember, I tried to introduce you to her. No, yeah. and you had met her about five minutes before I introduced you. Not even that. I mean, it like, was, like you 30 were on the seconds. ball. 
Yeah, it was it was the strolling with the stars, right? So she was one That's of the right. group that went walking in the early morning. It's the only time you can walk because it's like 100 degrees, right? So yeah. so at like 8 a.m. or something, you go for a 45-minute walk. Uh, and I walked up, and Tony was there, and an unnamed editor X. And uh, um, not that I've forgotten the name, but there's no reason to bring it up. And <laughs> I know who that is. And we were, and we were you know, we, were, we talked a little bit, and, and Tony said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a writer. And she said, well, you're kind of wearing the uniform. I was wearing a, a black blazer. And she said, what do you write? And I said, well, what, right now what I'm, what I'm uh, you know, looking for a home for is uh, it's kind of Game of Thrones meets Last of the Mohicans. And uh, Tony said, huh, interesting. And Editor X went, humph, and turned her back. <laughs> 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 All right, guys, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to hear more from uh, from Dave, because he has had a really interesting career, and, I mean, this man has been all over publishing. It's been pretty wild. John Abbott has a new job, a young family, and a mountain of debt. A six-month interstellar journey to Surabar system was a big bet requiring total commitment, but the payoff can be huge. Cerevar company traders can trade for their own account, buying the famous Samori weave on planet and shipping it back to Earth so company traders get rich. But John immediately gets assigned to investigate corruption. Someone at a remote frontier station called Arrowhawk has been skimming from the till. As he digs into the crime, the criminals start to threaten him, and then his family, and then all of Arrowhawk Post. Can John Abbott stop the criminals? Can he work for the company without losing his soul? Can he and his young family even survive? Never underestimate a man who's all in. Abbott in Darkness, new fiction from DJ Butler. Available at Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Pick up your copy today. All right, welcome back. In case you missed the first half of the episode for some unknown reason, I'm not sure how you would skip it, but uh, today Larry and I are joined by our good friend Dave Butler, um, fantastic fantasy author uh, from Bain, who also happens to be doing all sorts of other crazy awesome stuff and who has done lots of crazy and also lots of awesome stuff. So, uh, all right, first half, the first part of the episode, we, you know, Dave was kind of giving us, giving everybody, all the listeners out there, the uh, the Cliff Notes version of how we got into it, how we met, you know, how he, he decided to to get back into writing. How he met Tony Weisskopf, all that. So, I think I think before we kind of start moving into to some of this, there, what I want to get out of the way, so we don't we don't actually <laughs> accidentally forget to do it in our ramblings, is uh, so Dave, you just had a book come out. Oh yeah, uh, day before yesterday, two days ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So so what is it? Tell us about it. Why uh, is it awesome? It is called Abbott in Darkness. Uh, it is my 15th novel. It is my eighth novel with Bain Books. Um, my 11th traditionally published novel. So uh, Abbott in Darkness is um, it's the first book in a new series. Uh, it's, it's readable on a standalone basis. It's a series, but it's not, there's not like a dark lord to vanquish where it's not going to end like two towers or something. Um, so Abbott, John Abbott is an accountant. He's just finished his... I love this guy already. His master's degree. I'm, I'm all, right. all in. Me yeah. and Steve are... I also know. feel very sorry for him suddenly. Yeah. 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 Space accountant. Space uh, tax season. He Sounds is, like crap. He is a space accountant. Uh, that, uh, something like 100 years in the future. Okay. Uh, he's a young guy, married young. Uh, his family are uh, military types. He, he went to join the Space Force. Like his uncle and his father, they're all pilots or kind of special forces guys. Uh, and at the age of 18, uh, the arm, the Space Force diagnoses him uh, with Marfan syndrome, uh, which is a, uh, a genetic disorder uh, in which you have really weak connective tissues. And um, the uh, so so the reason I know about this is because we had a pediatrician tell my tell us you should get your son looked at he might have Marfan syndrome. So far, it doesn't seem that he does, but you get very very flexible joints. Um, but the all of which is just kind of 
stupid human tricks. You, you, know, you touch the bottom of a wine glass with all your fingers kind of stuff. Uh, but also your your connective tissues internally are weak. And so you like violent jarring is is likely to give you to disconnect your heart, for example. So pulling G's is a bad so call. So you can't pull G's. Okay. That's exactly right. So they said you, you can't be a pilot. Yeah. So uh, so he so he's he goes and he, so he marries young. Uh, and, uh, and, and goes and gets this accounting degree and he's got two young daughters and, and a wife and a lot of debt. Uh, and he gets his first job, which Think you just described every, yeah, every newbie right. accountant out there in the world. That's exactly, there's a hundred thousand guys out there going, that's me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and he gets a, he gets a job offer from the Sarabar company, which looks like a ticket to print money. And the reason is earth is in contact with other alien races but it has control of one system that is not uh that is not sol okay and that is this sarovar where there's a there is a wormhole at the edge of our solar system okay. that goes 40 light years to this other system which is very rich it's got indigenous species but also just great uh, natural resources okay. some of which are are are, are distinctive or unique mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I don't believe in the whole one Earth government federation future. So uh, it's not Earth generically that controls this system. It's the U.S. Congress. And what they do is they basically subcontract management of the system to a U.S. federally chartered corporation, the Saravar Company. Okay. Okay. Sure. And uh, it takes six months to get to this uh, system through this wormhole. So what you end up with is it's kind of like an age of sale East India s company setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where the company is far away, it has a profit motive. Man, corruption is easy. But the reason that, that's not that's not why it's a ticket to print money for John. That's not why he's excited. The the, the deal that the star of our company offers its employees is you can trade for your own account. Look, the salary's fine, but bring your own money. You can buy goods here and sell them on Earth, and you'll get rich. And that's, John doesn't want to get rich. He wants to pay off his debt and make a nest egg and take care of his, you know, mm -hmm. his two kids. Uh, except when he gets there, um, his, uh, em the, the employer who signed his offer letter takes him aside and says, uh, hey, look, uh, I'm going to send you out to this little frontier post on the boonies. And uh, the reason I'm sending you there is because I think they're skimming and I want you to go investigate, which turns out to be not only true, uh, but reason for people to start shooting at John. Uh, and, and then you get into the sort of war with the natives scenarios okay. uh, as it all falls apart. So it's it's science fiction, but it's a little bit like um, reading like frontier tales, frontier yeah. America or East India Company kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it came out two days ago. Interesting. Publishers Weekly called me competent. They did. Yes, they called you competent. <laughs> they said it competent. Yes. That's good. They don't even bother to read my books before <laughs> yeah. they review them. So that's pretty good, actually. Competence, yeah. high praise there. Yeah. <laughs> That means they at least probably read the beginning. They, I think they read the beginning. Yes, based on the rest of the review, they read the beginning. Now, I happen to know you're kind of a history nut. Yeah. Um, you're, you're that guy that studies dead languages and weird stuff like that. I am. Yes, I'm a weird stuff nut. So, so I, I've got to imagine that some of that background in that love, I mean, it, just from listening to you describe uh, the novel, it sounds like you're pulling a lot of that. There's a lot of those loves and stuff in there. The, you know, I will tell you this. Here is something I have revealed. I think in no other source. This is a. Oh, okay. This is a. This is a scoop. We got a scoop, baby. Okay, here's a scoop. Um, there are humans on the planet, and the official history is, a colony ship got there just shortly before the company did, and we kind of have to live with these people because they're here, and this, you know, we'll, we'll use them for menial jobs and stuff. Okay. <laughs> Except the problem is, as John sort of quickly learns, some of the people insist they've been there for a long time. Uh -huh. And there's a pigeon, there's a trade pigeon spoken on the planet by all the species. And uh, there's, there's a glossary in the back for the pigeon. But the pigeon is a real language. The pigeon is actually classic Egyptian. It's okay. classical Egyptian. It's, it's the language of the hieroglyphs is the, is the language that these people are speaking. All yeah. right. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, that's an interesting hook. Yeah. So see, room for sequels. See, what I like about this is so much science fiction these days, I feel like it, it, it's all about 
so many authors forget that that human and character and stuff like that is important in science fiction. They try so hard to talk to, to impress upon you how smart they are and, yeah. and show you all of their degrees yeah. and all that stuff. And so from the sound of it, what I like is this is sounding a bit more, I mean, pretty much everything you described had to, had to revolve around the conflict the character was facing. Yep. And, and I mean, the, the listeners know this, Larry knows this when it comes to storytelling, like, I'm like 180% in on character. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I'm not smart enough to write hard sci-fi. Heck no. Uh, so, you know, because I, I barely passed college. Okay, guys. So don't expect like, you know, David <laughs> Weber level physics out of me anytime soon. I mean, again, Larry and I are accountants. We just, care about, we just care about organizing numbers. Yeah. I mean, I can organize numbers and I can do money all day <laughs> in my head, but don't ask me to do like orbital mechanics. No, okay? no, yeah. Yeah, that stuff. But no, I actually, this sounds really interesting, Dave. I'm, I'm, uh. Dang. I'm, it actually sounds that's a good pitch, and is I this, wish you luck. Uh, and I would encourage our I would encourage our listeners to to check it out. Yeah. So Thank now you. now a lot of our listeners are pretty hardcore Audible folks. Is is this on audio yet? Um, I don't know whether it is yet. Um, the my my Bane books all so far have come out mm -hmm. on uh, by recorded books. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Recordings. They never tell us when it's going to show up. They just do, um, and uh, those have become pretty quick after the release of the oh, book good, recently good. so i suspect within a month if not sooner um but i i can't control that but i think it's likely awesome um one thing we've not talked about yet because we talked about the kind of beginning of your career and now we're getting to like uh where you are now yeah um we're gonna do a whole episode uh coming up soon with dave about acquisitions um, oh yeah Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about like your knowledge? Well, actually, you know, let's save that for that episode. Because okay. actually, I have one yeah. other thing I want to get in this on the Dave, on the Dave Butler expose. Okay, awesome. well, let's hear it. You have another book coming out from Bayon pretty soon, that you co-wrote with another fellow that we've actually talked about on the show quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Mike Rothman, M. A. Rothman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. March. It's scheduled tentatively for March next year. That's pretty wow. quick. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten uh, I'm editing it currently. I've been doing editing today. Very nice. What's, right. the, what's the elevator pitch for that? Um, it's kind of uh, Quantum Leap meets Stargate, uh, but instead of a guy jumping back and forth in time trying to solve personal problems, it's a team. Well, okay, it's, it's kind of like Quantum Leap meets Stargate meets Monster Hunter International is what it is. It's a team <laughs> uh, jumping around in Earth's past, but finding that there are monsters. Mm -hmm. in earth past that's awesome and uh and battling them and 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 the the sort of a couple of wrinkles there one they're not like a swat team it's an archaeological dig team so okay. now they got a guy uh who's their head of security who's a who's an indian commando uh and they've got uh you know the the, the main character uh half jewish half chinese uh linguist is also a martial artist right so there's there's they're not action inept but uh you know uh they're 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 not with machine guns they're fighting with spears and stuff which is funny uh, so that was my question i was going to ask so they can't take their technology back with they, them. they they they're involuntarily transported so they have involuntarily like, yeah they have like a handful of pocket knives and and they uh, they arrive in uh, they 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 realize for astronomical reasons uh, pretty quickly that they are in the past um, and they they figure out they're about thirty two hundred B C in the past. Oh, okay. So we're like we're not talking like they went back to like twenty eighteen to prevent the great rat scourge. Like right. They're right. You know they're they're going back <laughs> like way back. Yes, the although, way back the, using the wayback machine. Yeah, it, when and when they first realize they're in the past, one character says, "We really need to talk about the important issues." Another guy says, "Yes, whether we should kill Hitler." Uh, <laughs> and it's all by you know five thousand years. Uh, so um, yeah, and, and and so in this book one, they're entirely in ancient North Africa and and egypt okay uh and uh, what they see is there are these uh monstrous races that look like the egyptian gods in okay. particular uh, a race that looks like the egyptian god seth so it's got a head that is something like a jackal's head mm -hmm. but has squared off ears 
Um, and uh, yeah, I see. I see where you're pulling this, or you're saying like a little bit of Stargate in there. I see where you're pulling a little it, bit of that. Yeah, this is book. actually funny because me and Steve have a long history of role playing games involving Jackal Man. Yes. Okay. We're, we're big fans. Yeah, it's, it's like a been a recurring joke in our role playing games for about ten years now. That <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I got possessed by a jackal god one time, and it like you never, never <laughs> every ever time. In fact, down. we just we just did another one where it came up again. We've brought it into like six different genres yeah, too. It's so awesome. Jackal gods are like very diverse. Yeah, we're awesome. very happy. No, awesome. I'm excited for this one just because like I, I've always everything of yours I've read I've enjoyed, and you've got a really cool writing style. And like I said. I, it, you you have an intellectual writing style yes. without it being annoying or pretentious. Oh, thank you. Um, like you do your research, you do your homework. That comes through. It conveys the knowledge. And I like Rothman a lot uh, too. And it's funny that you mentioned the Chinese Jewish character because for Servants of War, the novel Steve and I wrote together, uh, Michael Rothman was our Jewish culture consultant. Basically, yeah. we had a we had a, ra a rabbi character. Yep. And so he went through to make sure we didn't screw up anything or. Uh, that's okay. I, I'm his consulting Mormon too. Sometimes, so yeah, that's I, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I am curious with with all of your with all of your your love of history and all that stuff. And and Larry alluded to this with. I mean, gosh, we've we've all read this stuff. I mean, I, I think all three of us and and so many of our listeners have 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 read the books and the stories that are out there, where it's obvious that the guy did a lot of research. Yeah, but it's also obvious that they care more about telling you about the research they did. Yeah. So I'm curious how how you as an author are able to strike that balance. Like, is it like I got to imagine there's a little bit of a conscious decision here. Yeah. That's, so that's... so how is it that you're able to to pull this off? I mean, not not bore the reader to death with historical stuff. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question and potentially a very long conversation. I, right. I think there's I think we fool we trick new writers. Okay. I think it might even be deliberate. We're trying to prevent them from becoming competition. So we sideline them into useless pursuits so they can't actually <laughs> write new books. And, and we do that by telling them that an important activity is world building. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, okay. And then they go and fill voluminous notebooks with uh, crap. They basically write the Cimmerillion before they've, uh, you know, right. had an actual story. Yes. Right. Uh, and, and, um, and and God bless them. Uh, they're they're they're. Wait, is that a curse word? Is that going to get? No, nope, you're oh, good. We can say that. You can say that. Okay, we can good. say that. We're not going to get demonetized for that. I didn't know how like how we how the profanity was <laughs> scaled. Okay, good. We're not on like Molly Mormon level profanity. No, we, can... we just can't f bomb too much. Okay, good. Without getting in trouble, I will. Yeah. I will avoid that. I think. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> you think? Uh, you probably. Uh, <laughs> it's fifty fifty. Fifty fifty. So. Um, you know they they get very excited about it, and you meet them, and they and they want to tell you about this, and and they're they're so interested. But the truth is, for almost any book, all that stuff, the reader's not going to know it. And and what we really should be teaching young writers is not world building. We should be calling it something else, and it's world telling. And world telling is an art of sleight of hand. It is all about showing someone enough to create the illusion that there is a bigger world uh -huh. and create the illusion that they can participate in the world and using things that resonate with them so that the the resonance creates more images you know details or references that the person then in their own mind thinks oh this or this or this and there they have now created the world all right that's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I, you can't see it, but I totally wrote down that, uh, that world telling because I, I, I like the concept there. And I think it dovetails really well with what Larry and I have been telling people for, you know, however many 30 some odd episodes that we've been doing the show now. Yeah, we've done a few world building episodes. But this is something we could definitely revisit. Yeah. Because and, it, you're spot on there. There's a, there's a tendency to over explain, which kind of gives away the game. And that's like really good, cool stuff you could say for sequels. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you know what? I, here's what I think we're gonna do. Let's. Um, I, I think since we since we have Dave held prisoner within this studio, um, we're just gonna chain him to the table, um, in a in a completely sexy way. And what we're gonna do is make sure that always. Uh, always. Um, I think we're gonna hit this topic in another episode because I think I, I love the way you're describing it, and I think it's a different way than. I mean, at the end of the day, I think I think the three of us 
our, our minds kind of go in the same places when it comes to this. But the way I describe things and the way Larry describes things is very different than the way you're describing them. And I know there's got to be listeners out there that the way that you're describing it is going to resonate with them. Cool. So just like you would in a in like an old 90s like TV show, imagine in your head, listeners, the big giant words popping up on the screen to be continued. Rattle of chains in the background. We'll be back. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. I'm just an alpha predator that roams the wilds of Twitter, picking off the sick and the weak.